In this video, I'll go over the top 5 scratch hacks. These tips and tricks will help you considerably enhance your games and take them to a whole other level. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. At number 5, we have mouse scroll detection. This is a genius way to detect instances where the user is scrolling their mouse wheel. You may know that there are two blocks to detect when a key is pressed. We have the when key is pressed boolean block and the when key is pressed event block. When we take the case of the up arrow, these have a very subtle difference. The event block will detect both the up arrow and the upward mouse wheel while the boolean block only detects the arrow key. So, if we want to run a particular script only when the mouse wheel scrolls up, then we can use this property to our advantage. To detect the scroll, we just check if the boolean condition is false within the event block itself. This way, we detect the scroll while ensuring that the up arrow key itself is not pressed. And that is it. If you test the program, the scratch cat does not react on pressing the up arrow, but it does move on scrolling the mouse wheel. This is perfect and exactly what we are looking for here. If you want to design a scroll down script, then you can use these blocks the same way, just by changing the up arrow in both the instances to the down arrow. If you test this out again, then the code will work almost identically as before, except that now it's a downward scroll. It's a pretty cool hack and not one that most scratchers are aware about. At number 4, we have the black and white effect. This is a super fun hack to convert your colored sprites into their black and white counterpart. For this effect, you will basically require two of the same block, the set color effect. For the second one, you can change it to the brightness. If you aren't aware, the color effect loops every 200 times, where a change in one of this effect causes an increase of 0.5 in the scratch hue. You can see in the costume tab that if we move from 0 to 100, the color remains exactly the same. This is nice, but the interesting thing is that this block completely glitches out when we give it a really high value. So here, I'll just set it to be 1 divided by 0, which is infinity. If you test it out, then you'll see that the cat goes completely black and white. Now of course, you may sometimes want to change the grayness, and this is where the brightness comes into play. If you set it to something like 50, you'll get a 50% reduction in the blackness of the image. It's pretty fun to play with and I find it really cool. At number 3, we have shooting. This is a cornerstone of so many games and it's definitely one of the most important game mechanisms. Right here, I have a simple horizontal movement script where the spaceship moves at the bottom. In addition to that, I have a bullet sprite whose costume is basically just a small rectangle. What we will do is quite simple. When the bullet sprite receives a trigger, say when the space key is pressed, we will create a copy of the bullet in the exact location of the starfighter's gun and then make it move upwards until it reaches the edge. We can start off in the player itself. When the space key is pressed, we will create a clone of the bullet. Leaving it this way would allow for spamming which can get super messy, so to prevent this from happening, we will create a small wait lag of 0.2 seconds. That's really all there is for the player sprite. For the bullet, we will be only using the clones of the sprite and not the sprite itself, so we can hide the sprite when the green flag is clicked. Alright, now it's time for the main script. When a clone is created, first it must go to the player's location. Since the bullet should move upward, point in direction 0 degrees. Keep in mind that the player's ship is centered, so the bullet would be at the center of the ship rather than the tip of the gun. To fix this, we just move the clone to the correct place. In the costume editor, a single square represents 4 pixels. You can see that the tip is 10.5 squares at the top, so we change y by 4 multiplied by 10.5, which is 42 pixels. I'll also offset x by 1, just for this particular case. Almost there, the sprite is hidden and at this point the clone will be 2. So we just move to the front layer and then show. To keep moving the clone, we repeat until it hits the edge and move 10 steps each time. 
we will no longer need the clone after this, so just delete the clone. And that is it. If you test the program, then you should have shooting. This is the simple version of the script. And while it does work in cases like this, it has one really major problem. To illustrate this, I have here a second project with almost the exact same scripts. The only difference is that the player is this weirder looking spaceship and the fact that the player can rotate. Also, I've made the bullet start at this corner location. You can see that it works pretty much the same way as before. However, when I rotate the spaceship and shoot, it's clearly a total mess. I mean, this is a really visible bug. In order to fix this, we must go from rectangular coordinates, which we've been using, to polar coordinates. Let's program this bullet script once again. First of all, we must point in direction of the player itself. This must be fairly intuitive. The bullet will now move in a perpendicular direction, so turn anti-clockwise by 90 degrees. If this doesn't make sense to you, then remember that we pointed in direction 0 when the spaceship was tilted at 90 degrees. Now we have to move the same number of steps that we did before. When the spaceship is normal, that is 12 squares or 48 pixels. Next, we have to move to the right. In general, this is by turning clockwise and then by moving the same number of steps. In this case, it's 30. Lastly, we also need to point in the correct direction once again, so turn anti-clockwise by 90. And that is it. Just connect the same block that you used before to this script. If you test out the program, the shooting script will work perfectly, both during movement and during rotation. It's a super useful trick, so always keep this in mind. At number 2, we have clone positioning. Here, I'll go over the working of clones and how you can use them to your advantage. You're probably aware that instead of duplicating sprites a whole bunch of times, you can instead use clones. One thing that most people don't know, however, is how these private variables interact with the clones themselves. Let's take a simple example, one of positioning. Say that you would like to have five of these squares positioned this way from left to right. A very inefficient way would be to duplicate this five times and then change the position for each one. Not only would this take longer, but if we wanted to change something in the code, it's basically going to be a nightmare. What we can do instead is create a private clone ID variable, that is set it for this sprite only. Initially, we can set it to be 1. Now is the cool part, we can just create 5 clones and immediately after creating a single clone, change the clone ID by 1. Since the clone ID variable is private, each clone will have its own unique clone ID variable. Since we created 5 clones, each of them will have a different clone ID value. The main sprite itself will have a clone ID of 6 at the end of this clone creation process. Since we would like to just have the clones, we can show the sprite at the start and hide it at the end. And here comes the magic. For each clone, we move to the X position of the value of the first clone, in our case negative 200, plus clone ID minus 1 multiplied by the spacing. Here it's 100. And yup, that is it. You can see now that our clones are positioned perfectly. Changing the spacing now is insanely easy. Just modify the starting and the multiplicative values and you are good to go. You can see that this saves a lot of time and it also makes the script way more functional. You can actually get way more creative with this with nested loops and stuff and I use this literally all the time. Finally, at number one, we have flying. This is possibly one of the most useful things to add in your games. Here, I'll share two different flying algorithms that you can use. The first is a jumping type flying, which is very common in games like Flappy Bird. And the other is a more smooth type, which is common in games like Geometry Dash. Let's start with the Flappy Bird flying template. At this point, I have the bird sprite with three different costumes. All the code that I have here does is to animate this with a small weight lag between the costumes. There's no gravity or flying at this point. 
Let's start by creating a variable to control the y velocity. At the start, the y well must be zero. At this point, the y position is not affected by the y well variable, but when the space key is pressed, we will want the sprite to immediately jump up and thus we set it to 8. Now the main forever loop. We always change y by the y velocity and then add gravity by changing the y velocity by negative 1. If you test it out, then you should have a working flying script. But we can make an improvement to this quite easily by modifying the bird's direction as it flies. For this, we'll need to use a little bit of trigonometry. We can imagine the bird tilted at an angle about the horizontal axis. Let's say that the speed along the x-axis is 8. The speed along the y-axis is y well, and thus the tilted angle here is the inverse tangent of y well divided by 8. When we are setting the direction, we have to enter the number with respect to the y-axis, and that is just 90 minus this angle which gives us the final expression. Alright, getting back to the code, we point in direction 90 minus a tan of y well divided by 8. We need to set this before changing the y velocity so that it remains accurate to the motion. Well, if you test it out, then the motion will look significantly better than before. You can use this technique in pretty much every single game that uses this type of motion. Great, I'll now go through the second way of creating the flying animation. Right here, I have a similar start with the y velocity variable. But we will need to make some changes inside the main forever loop. First, as usual, we change y by the y velocity. Next, we will use the same direction trick as before. The math is exactly the same, so I won't go through that once again. Now are the differences. Previously, we used an event block for the space key, which is used for detecting a discrete key press. In our case, we wouldn't mind a quicker and smoother detection, so we'll use the sensing block instead. Instead of setting the y velocity, we will change the y velocity by 1.5 instead. This way, there will be a smoother upward motion. Lastly, we add gravity the same way by changing the y velocity by negative 1. And that is it. If you test the program, then you will get this silky smooth flying motion. It's super fun to use, so do keep this in mind. And there you have it, 5 awesome scratch tricks to improve your game. Make sure you leave a like if this helped you out, and until next time, peace out.